Hi everyone, this lesson is on iron deficiency anemia. So we're going to talk about what causes iron deficiency anemia. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So iron deficiency anemia, if we were to actually look at the word anemia and break it down, the prefix an refers to lack and emia refers to a blood condition. So anemia essentially means lack of blood. And anemia more specifically means a low hemoglobin count or low hematocrit. So there are particular numbers for the cutoff for hemoglobin and hematocrit to make a definition or a diagnosis of anemia. Now, these numbers are going to be different in different references, but for the most part, we're going to see that with hemoglobin, if it's less than 130 grams per liter in males, that would be considered anemia. If it's less than 120 grams per liter in females, that would be considered anemia. So we can see there's slight differences between males and females. And with regards to hematocrit, which is the ratio of red blood cells in the blood, if it's less than 0.41 in males, that would be considered anemia. If it's less than 0.38 in females, that would be considered anemia. So again, these are going to be some reference values. You may see some slightly different ones in different sources. So why is anemia important? Why do we actually need a proper amount of red blood cells? So let's first talk about red blood cells. Red blood cells are also known as erythrocytes. And here is a blood smear showing a red blood cell. These are all red blood cells. We're going to talk a bit more in detail as to what might be going on with these red blood cells in iron deficiency anemia later on in this lesson. Now, what's important with regards to red blood cells is that they contain hemoglobin, which is important for carrying oxygen to other cells and tissues. They are essentially bags of hemoglobin that carry oxygen around to cells and tissues. They can also carry carbon dioxide from tissues back to the lungs as well. So they have multiple functions, but what you need to remember is that they are essential for carrying oxygen to cells and tissues. Now, the average lifespan of a red blood cell is approximately 120 days. And iron is required for production of red blood cells. Iron is part of the hemoglobin. It's part of the structure of hemoglobin. So if there's not enough iron, we're going to get iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency anemia is an anemia or a low blood count or a low hemoglobin count caused by a deficiency of iron. So what is the epidemiology of iron deficiency anemia? Iron deficiency anemia is actually the most common type of anemia, so it affects a large portion of the world population. And it's more common in reproductive age women. Approximately 10% of reproductive age women may suffer from iron deficiency anemia. We're going to talk about why that occurs in the next slide. And then young children are also at an increased risk for iron deficiency anemia. We're also going to talk about why this occurs as well in the next slide. Now let's talk about the causes of iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia can be broken down into three categories of causes. One of them is decreased intake of iron. Another one is increased losses or increased loss of iron. And another one is increased utilization. So these are the three main categories of causes of iron deficiency anemia. Now let's get into the more specific causes in each category. In the decreased intake category, one main cause is a low dietary iron consumption. So you can imagine that if you're not eating enough iron or not getting enough iron in your diet, you're not going to have enough iron to make red blood cells or make hemoglobin. So this is going to cause iron deficiency anemia. So some examples of a low dietary iron consumption include children on cow's milk. So very young children who drink lots and lots of cow's milk don't get enough iron from that source. So this can lead to an iron deficiency anemia. This doesn't happen in children who are fed breast milk because breast milk contains more iron and that iron is more available to the child. And then some vegan and vegetarian diets also can lead to an iron deficiency anemia because of low iron content in those diets. So some vegan and vegetarian diets may also lead to decreased intake of iron. Some malabsorptive conditions can also lead to a iron deficiency. So an individual might be eating enough iron, but they're not absorbing that iron as well as they should. Some of these conditions include celiac disease. So celiac disease affects the first part of the small intestine or the duodenum. And the first part of the small intestine is where iron is absorbed. So celiac disease is one of those conditions that can affect the absorption of iron in the duodenum. And Crohn's disease is also another condition. So Crohn's disease can cause inflammation in the duodenum, leading to issues with absorption of iron. 
And then some gastrointestinal surgeries can also cause or lead to an iron deficiency anemia. So if certain parts of the gastrointestinal tract are removed, that part of gastrointestinal tract will no longer be able to participate in absorption of nutrients. And one of those might be iron. So certain gastrointestinal surgeries can increase the likelihood of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. Now let's talk about increased losses. Increased losses are actually broken down into two subcategories. One of them is hemolysis or breakdown of cells or breakdown of red blood cells more specifically. And the other one is hemorrhage or bleeding. So in hemolysis, there are certain blood conditions that can lead to the destruction of red blood cells, and this includes intravascular hemolysis. One of these intravascular hemolysis conditions is TTP or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And then the other one is DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. So these both can lead to hemolysis or breakdown of red blood cells, leading to losses of those red blood cells, losses of that iron, and eventual iron deficiency anemia. And then hemorrhage is also another common cause of iron deficiency anemia. This is actually going to happen in most cases. So most cases of iron deficiency anemia will be found in this category, in the hemorrhage or blood losses category. Number one is going to be menstruation. So menstruation is the reason why reproductive age women are more likely to get iron deficiency anemia. Blood losses from each menstrual cycle can lead to enough blood losses where an individual loses iron from the blood losses but doesn't bring in enough to compensate for those losses. And more specifically, if a patient experiences menorrhagia, which is excessive menstrual bleeding, this can also make it worse. So they can have way more blood loss and not enough iron brought back in in their diet to make up for that blood loss. Now, gastrointestinal bleeding is the second most common cause of iron deficiency anemia. So whereas menstruation is going to be the most common cause in reproductive age women, in older patients or in male patients, gastrointestinal bleeding is going to be the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia. So gastrointestinal bleeding might come from many different sources or many different conditions. Some of them can include peptic ulcer disease, colorectal cancer, celiac disease, and other conditions that lead to bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract. So again, this is going to be the most common cause in male patients and in older female patients who are postmenopausal. Acute blood loss is also another cause of iron deficiency anemia. So we can imagine that if someone cut themselves or there's a large cut and they've lost a lot of blood, that can lead to iron deficiency anemia. And then some other ones include chronic nosebleeds. So if someone's having lots of nosebleeds multiple times, this can lead to enough blood loss where patient loses iron but doesn't get it back in time or doesn't get enough to compensate for those losses and this can lead to iron deficiency anemia and then there's some urinary losses as well hematuria which is blood in the urine can also occur if a patient has issues with their urinary tract if they have issues with their bladder and there's blood loss from those sources this can cause iron deficiency anemia as well And the last category of causes is increased utilization. So although the patient might be getting enough in their diet, they might be absorbing, they might be able to utilize it properly, they actually need more than they're bringing in in their diet. And some of these cases include pregnancy. So because an individual who's pregnant also has an infant who also requires iron, that patient might require even more iron in their diet. So although they're bringing in iron in their diet and they're also absorbing it properly. They're not losing any. They need more than usual. So they're going to deplete their iron stores quicker. And then another case where increased utilization may be a cause is growth and development. So when children are very young and they're growing rapidly or in adolescence where they're growing rapidly as well, they're going to need more iron during those times. So they're going to have to have more iron in their diet because they have a situation where they're requiring more for utilization. So this is the reason why young children can be at an increased risk for getting iron deficiency anemia as well. So these are the main causes of iron deficiency anemia. Now that we know the causes of iron deficiency anemia, let's talk about the signs and symptoms that occur in iron deficiency anemia. The first one is going to be fatigue. So fatigue is actually going to be the most common symptom of iron deficiency anemia. 
And you can imagine that if there's not enough red blood cells, there's not enough hemoglobin, there's not going to be enough oxygen getting to cells and tissues. So patient's going to feel very tired and fatigued because of this. Patients can also experience pallor. So being more pale, their skin tone is going to be more pale than usual. And in some more severe cases, they may get subconjunctival pallor. So looking at their eyelid, if it's very pale, this can be an indication of anemia as well. Poor concentration. So because blood getting to the brain and delivering oxygen to the brain is very important for mental functioning. If they have a reduction in this, they're going to have issues with mental functioning like concentration. So they're going to have poor concentration. Presyncope and syncope, so feeling dizzy or actually fainting can occur with iron deficiency anemia. Weakness, so feeling weak, this can go along with fatigue. Dyspnea, being short of breath, so because the body senses that there's not enough oxygen present, it's going to compensate by trying to breathe more or feeling short of breath. And then chest pain may also go along with this as well. So those are signs and symptoms that can occur with any type of anemia. But the next signs and symptoms we're going to talk about are more specific with regards to iron deficiency anemia. So these are going to occur more specifically with iron deficiency anemia. These include angular chelitis. So this is where there's inflammation and cracking of the corners of the lips. Coilonychia, so this is where there's spooning of the nails. Pica or pica, which is a craving to eat inedible material like dirt. And a lot of times patients with iron deficiency anemia may have cravings to eat ice or ice cubes. Patients can also have atrophic glossitis. So looking at the tongue, the tongue becomes very flattened and the lines in the tongue are lost. Aphthous ulcers can also occur with iron deficiency anemia. So the ulcerations like little canker sores in the mouth can occur. And then restless leg syndrome can also occur. This is a condition I always like to bring up because it is an associated condition with iron deficiency in general. So if a patient is deficient in iron, they can often experience restless leg syndrome. So I always like to bring this up as well. If you want more information on signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia, please check out my full lesson on that topic where I go into more specific detail into each of these signs and symptoms and go into more signs and symptoms as well. Now let's talk about the diagnosis and treatment of iron deficiency anemia. So first, the diagnosis is going to be oftentimes made by taking blood from the patient and doing a complete blood count, or CBC. What's going to be found on a CBC is the following. Low serum iron, that makes sense. If it's iron deficiency, we're going to see low iron in the serum of those patients. We're also going to see low ferritin. We're also going to see high transferrin. So transferrin binds to iron and transfers it through the blood. So in the case where we see high transferrin levels, that means that this transferrin is unbound to iron. So high transferrin signifies low iron. We're also going to see a high TIBC or a high total iron binding capacity. So because there's low iron in the body, the body has more ability to bind to iron. So this is the reason why we're going to see a high TIBC. And we're also going to see oftentimes a high red cell distribution width in iron deficiency anemia. So some of these can occur in other types of anemia, like anemia of chronic disease. But in anemia of chronic disease, we're going to see some slight differences, uh, especially with ferritin, as ferritin is going to be normal or elevated in most cases of chronic inflammation. Now, another very important finding with iron deficiency anemia is when looking at the complete blood count, it's important to look at the mean corpuscular volume or MCV. The mean corpuscular volume is the average volume of red blood cells. So it's the average size of red blood cells when looking at a large number of red blood cells. This is the average size. So MCV less than 80 is going to be found in iron deficiency anemia, which signifies microcytic anemia. So iron deficiency anemia is a microcytic anemia, meaning that the MCV is less than 80. And the anemia in iron deficiency anemia is also noted to be hypochromic anemia. So what does hypochromic mean? So if we actually look at a blood smear, if we look at the red blood cells individually, they have what we call central pallor, this whitened out area in the center of them. Hypochromic means that the whitened out area, the central pallor, is enlarged. So if we look at a more normal cell, the central pallor should be around one third of the diameter of the red blood cell. If it's more than that, we call this increased central pallor or hypochromic. So this one would be an example of a hypochromic cell. So with iron deficiency anemia, we're going to see microcytic 
hyperchromic anemia. So MCV less than 80 in hyperchromic, meaning that the central pallor of cells, when we look at it under a blood smear, is going to be enlarged. So those are very common findings in iron deficiency anemia. So although clinicians often use the complete blood count to diagnose iron deficiency anemia, the actual gold standard way of diagnosing iron deficiency anemia is by bone marrow biopsy, although this is almost never performed. So this is actually the gold standard way of diagnosing it, but oftentimes it's going to be diagnosed by a complete blood count. Now, how do clinicians treat this condition? Again, it's important to identify and treat the underlying cause. So we talked about all the causes earlier on in this lesson. So it's important to identify what is the potential cause, identify that cause, and treat that cause if applicable. It's also important to provide oral iron supplementation. So ferrous sulfate is an example of iron supplementation. And laxatives may also be required because iron supplementation can lead to constipation. And then in some cases where there's issues with absorption of iron, parenteral iron supplementation, so taking it by IV may be required. So this is in the form of iron dextran. So again, diagnosis oftentimes by complete blood count, and we note that there's decreased serum iron and decreased ferritin with elevated transferrin, TIBC, and red cell distribution width. Mean corbuscular volume is going to be less than 80, so it's a microcytic hypochromic anemia. And then bone marrow biopsy is actually the gold standard for diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. And then treatment, again, is going to be important to identify and treat the underlying cause. Oral iron supplementation with ferrous sulfate is an example or an option. And then parenteral iron supplementation with iron dextran is going to be important in patients who have issues with absorption or who do not recover or respond to oral iron supplementation. So if you want to learn more about other types of blood conditions, please check out my hematology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.